Hello and welcome everyone to IFAD's hosted session during the UN Behavioral Science Week. Please use the chat box to let us know where you're joining us from. This option will only be available during the first couple of minutes of the event to avoid distracting our speakers. Today's session focuses on behavioral approaches for development and climate programs, optimizing results and enhancing the nexus among gender equality, climate resilience, and nutrition. Today's event is being run thanks to our partnership with the Alliance of Biodiversity International and the International Center for Tropical Agriculture of the CJAR, the Busada Center for Behavioral Economics, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the Independent Evaluation Unit of the Green Climate Fund, and UN Women. Before we start, I would like to navigate you through some quick tips to help us run in a smooth and enjoyable event. Please use the Q&A box to post your questions and remember to upvote your favorite questions by clicking on the thumbs up icon on the Q&A box to help us prioritize which questions to address first. This is a reminder that today's event is being recorded. By joining the event, you are agreeing to the recording taking place. We have a full agenda today with the senior management of our partnering agencies and recognize experts in the fields of behavioral science, gender, climate, and nutrition. Due to our time constraint, I won't be able to do any justice to our speakers. So this is an invitation to visit our event page to check the speaker profiles and the event concept note and agenda. Without much further ado, I would like to welcome Juan Lucas Restrepo, Director General of the Alliance of Biodiversity International and the International Center for Tropical Agriculture of the CJAR. Juan Lucas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Gladys. It's great to see uh, already uh, an important number of people attending this uh, event. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to this session on behavioral approaches for development and climate programs. It's good to be here today to open this event uh, together with my colleagues, Anita Batia from UN Women and Maria Elena Semedo from FAO. Despite our efforts to tackle a climate change, gender inequality and malnutrition, we're still far away from winning the battle. In many of the poorest regions of the world, climate change is impacting crop yields, has a strong incidence on animal diseases, and leads to higher food prices and food and nutrition insecurity. Women are among the most vulnerable to climate change due to a number of factors such as social, economic, and cultural. While they make up 43% of the global agricultural labor force, they have less access to productive resources, land skills, development services, and decision-making than men. At the same time, they play a crucial role for the household's food security. Studies have shown that women, when women's income rise, they tend to invest more in the nutrition, education, and health of their family, causing a ripple effect that can benefit entire communities. They are behavior change champions at its best. One of the obstacles to achieving climate security, positive nutrition, and gender outcomes is the intention action gap in these areas meaning the difference between what people would like to do and what they actually end up doing. We usually think that sharing information on what people should do will change their behavior and uh, help us reach a certain outcome, but it doesn't necessarily work this way. There are many factors, physical, environmental, social, psychological, that influence people's behavior, and knowledge is only one of them. So behavior change needs an enabling environment. And I'll give you a short example on nutrition in Kenya. In Turkana County, we have observed that while education to households is essential to tackle mal malnutrition, it's not sufficient if there are major barriers to change this behavior, their behavior. Malnutrition in Turkana is also linked with poor road networks that make it difficult and ill-timed to transport food into rural areas, reducing its affordability, availability, and diversity. As a result, even though people may be educated on nutrition, they still adopt behaviors that perpetuate malnutrition, such as eating homogeneous diets, given the challenge to access more nutritious and diverse food. Behavioral science can help us understand the context in which a certain behavior occurs 
and the environmental conditions that influence people's behaviors. This approach does not only suggest that communities should grow it to tackle uh, malnutrition, but it also helps create an environment where these foods are more accessible and therefore where behaviors are more likely to change. One of the advantages of incorporating behavioral science into development programs is that it changes the narrative, putting the beneficiaries at the center of strategies to fight malnutrition, gender inequality, and climate change, among others. Today, we will hear about different experiences in using behavioral science approaches to achieve climate security, gender equality, and nutrition, and how successful results can be adopted to new contexts and scale up. Back, back to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, uh, Juan Lucas. Uh, I really like how you close that statement saying that behavioral sciences indeed changes the narrative, putting the beneficiaries at the center um, of, the, of the projects and ensuring that we achieve results mainly with them. So now I would like to uh, welcome Anita Batia, Assistant to the UN Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of the Resource Management UN System Coordination Sustainability and Partnerships uh, Department at UN Women. Anita, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining us from across the world. And I'm so delighted to be here on this panel today with Juan Lucas and with Maria Helena. And of course, a very big thanks to the organizers IFAD and the UN Innovation Network for inviting UN women to be part of this, uh, what I think will be a very stimulating discussion. Let me start by stating what are perhaps some rather obvious things, but do actually bear repeating. And that is that gender equality, climate resilience, food security, and nutrition are inextricably linked. And it really isn't possible for us to speak about how we can use behavioral science to change impact, to change impacts and to change outcomes on the ground without recognizing these vital links. We know that worldwide women play a really critical role in food systems, whether it is in production, processing, preparation, uh, and distribution of food, as well, of course, as being fundamental to securing household and community nutrition. Women can also be powerful agents in climate change mitigation and adaptation. And we know and we see evidence every day that they are leading what is essentially climate justice um, across the world. Now, women farmers and producers along with indigenous and peasant women are in fact building climate resilient futures. For instance, switching to drought resistant seeds, leading community-based reforestation efforts and deploying ancient knowledge and conservation practices. But behind all of this, there are structural gender inequalities, which actually significantly reduce the impact that women could have in these ways because women are prevented for either cultural or other reasons from accessing natural resources, finance, technology, uh, knowledge, and ultimately markets because of these structural barriers. And this, in fact, often means that they are unable to realize very fundamental rights, such as actually access to food. So climate access, climate stresses on food systems actually compounds these gender inequalities and adds to the burden of discriminatory social norms, which prevents women from getting fair and clear access in the first place. Now, how can we address this? So to mitigate the impact of climate change on food systems and on agriculture, UN Women has been working in its, uh, for the last 10 years, we've been in existence for 10 years and are actually celebrating our, our first decade. We have been working pretty much since inception to ensure gender responsive climate and agricultural policies, to increase women's land tenure security, 
to eliminate discriminatory social norms that keep women from uh, accessing uh, resources and helping women to take climate action, increasing women farmers access to climate smart um, information, technology and finance by strengthening their capacity to meaningfully participate in uh, green value chains, for instance. So just a few examples that I'd like to share with you. For example, in Cote d'Ivoire, UN Women has been working with um, shea butter farmers and producers to help them obtain certification that would allow them to export their products and to access markets, giving them an opportunity to increase the value and the price of their goods. In Senegal, as part of the COVID response, we had worked with women-led agricultural cooperatives uh, through um, affirmative procurement agreements. In Malawi, we are working with women groundnut producers who uh, we are helping them to secure access to markets so that uh, by giving them access to uh, time-saving equipment. So these are just some examples of um, uh, interventions that are allowing women to overcome the structural barriers that I referred to earlier. Now, underlying a lot of these uh, are innovations. And innovation is in fact at the core of many of the climate smart solutions. And it is really important for scaling up effective programs and enhancing project results. And although we don't explicitly say it, in fact, behavioral science is at the, um, is very much a foundation of some of these innovations because we are able to actually test uh, the intent, the motivation of participants in these programs. We are able to, through feedback loops, understand whether things are working or, and whether they're not. And based on that information, we're able to adjust and redeploy resources as needed. So our approach to innovation, which is really underpinned by behavioral thinking, is to identify potential high impact innovations that can drive gender equality uh, by promoting women as innovators or equal participants in these experiments. We test, we monitor, uh, we prototype, we pilot, and then we scale up those innovations that can increase impact and, and change the lives of women and girls. And as the world becomes increasingly digitized, digital tools and approaches are also going to be increasingly relevant in helping us roll out these behavioral science-based approaches. And so just some examples of this are the work that we have been doing uh, with blockchain technology uh, in uh, refugee camps in Jordan, for instance. And we have found huge uptake for some of these programs, which have enabled women to have independent access to resources. So this just is to paint a picture of some of the innovations that UN Women has been piloting and is working to take to scale with partners. What's really important for us today is to recognize that if we really want to leapfrog, and if we really want to have significant impact in a short period of time to overcome what we have seen has transpired in the last year, which has really been to uh, see a fundamental and important and unfortunately very negative impact overall on the status of women. Um, so much so that we fear a real, loss of gender equality in many aspects, um, including uh, as in women's participation and uh, climate resilient agriculture, women's participation in income generating opportunities. We have seen such a big uh, regression in the last year because of the pandemic. And so if we want to come out of the pandemic by building forward better, it is going to be very important to put innovation technology uh, and to marshal the evidence from behavioral science to come up with solutions that can help us leapfrog. 
One of the things that I'd just like to share with you in closing is that UN Women is together with the governments of France and Mexico co-leading an initiative called the Generation Equality Initiative. And under this initiative, we have a number of action coalitions and these action coalitions are really platforms of partners from civil society, academics, think tanks, the private sector, and of course governments to try to achieve these leapfrogging um, innovations that can make a significant uh, shift in a short period of time. So there is an action coalition on innovation and technology. And I'd like to invite all of you who are not yet members, institutions uh, who are not yet members of this coalition to consider joining the coalition and to making significant commitments to invest in innovation technology with a behavioral lens to drive some of the changes that will affect positively this nexus between climate and gender equality. Our forum takes place in Paris next week. And we are really excited about the vast numbers of partners who've already joined us and are using this platform to re-examine what they are doing with a gender lens and actually significantly up their ambition to do more. Let me conclude by saying that the gender dimensions of climate risks are actually key to making progress on gender equality on climate resilience, on food security, on nutrition. And if we want to avoid further exacerbating the inequalities that so sharply developed in the last year, we are going to have to do this with a sense of radical impatience and with a sense of urgency. Feeding the world in a changing environment is actually going to require major shifts in behavior, not just at the individual level, but at the group level, at the institutional level, at the government level. And this transition to sustainable production and agriculture, the consumption of healthy and nutritious diets is actually a huge opportunity because it is both a business opportunity, but also something that allows the world to do well while doing good. It is going to require a substantial shift in human behavior, moving the focus perhaps from the individual to the collective and uh, from a fully market-based system to a system which recognizes that markets often fail and do not deliver goods, services, and gender equality at the scale that is required for a just and inclusive world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anita. And thank you for um, emphasizing the fact that uh, gender equality, climate resilience, food systems, and nutrition are linked in a way that is uh, impossible to separate. Thank you also for sharing all those details about the work that uh, UN Women is doing in behavioral sciences. Uh, if people want to read more about that, the 2021 UN Behavioral Science Report is, is now out and I invite you all to, to check it out. I would like now to welcome Maria Elena Semedo, Deputy Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Maria Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys, and good morning, good afternoon, and evening to all the participants, dear United Nations colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to join this op the opening of this event with my colleagues Juan Lucas and Anita, exploring how behavioral science can address the gender, climate change, and nutritious nexus. Our agri-food systems are at the heart of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And the interplay between agriculture, food, nutrition, gender, and climate re resilience must be part of an integrated and multi-sectoral approach to ensure such transformation. Acts and decisions of billions of people, millions of communities, governments and other stakeholders can influence a transition to sustainable lifestyles and a circular economy. But increasing knowledge and awareness without addressing human behavior does not translate into long-term impact. We should 
re-examine our development efforts to ensure that our intervention and projects truly consider how children, youth, women, and, and men make decisions and then build enabling conditions for health and sustainability enhancing behaviors. And my colleagues has already referred to that, that we need to have individual and collective change. When thinking on how to reshape our diets for greener and climate smart option, we must ensure healthy nutrition for all, including the most vulnerable and poor, and vice versa. Looking at gender aspects of food security for sustainable and innovative solution to tackle the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. Our personal consumer choices matter too. For instance, considerable work has done into food loss and waste measures and the adoption of sustainable and healthy food choices. And while a large percentage of consumers indicate their intention to adopt good practices, only a fraction do. I think even us, we don't do. The cost of adopt behavior science to our programs is low compared to the impacts they can have. Inaction will cost us even more. Recognizing this, FAO is embracing behavior science to support the transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems. And let me share with you a few examples. FAO is incorporating behavioral science in food and nutrition education models with toolkits for designing, implementing, and evaluating school-based food education programs. Let me give one to address climate change. We are launching behavior action packs through the UNGA collaboration with United Nations agencies and youth organizations such as scouts and guides, empower, for example, 45,000 young women and girls in Africa. And this will really bring uh, behavior change. Behavior science also has enormous potential to achieve gender equality and empower women and girls. FAO, together with our sister agencies, IFAD and World Food Program, is implementing gender transformative approaches for food security and nutrition to change our policy dialogue, programs, institutional culture and work modalities. Another example too regarding gender, we have our flagship Demitra clubs having now more than 6,000 across Sub-Saharan Africa. And those clubs have facilitated collective action and change in gender-related behavior and norms and decision-making processes, triggering benefits in the variety of areas, including nutrition, climate smart adaptation, agriculture, resilience, social cohesion, and peace. We also promote the appropriate use of antimicrobials and improve food production through our AMR behavior change community of practices linking behavioral scientists with governments, civil society, and private sector. We are also integrating behavior science principles in our corporate environmental responsibility too. But we need a more systematic application of behavioral science. FAO and partners of the Tropical Agriculture Platform work to boost national and agricultural innovation systems. And it has been said how important is innovation and farmer organization to improve their soft skills, to engage in a complexities of political process to realize the potential of innovation. In this regard, our Office of Innovation will coordinate and strengthen behavioral science work internally and with our United Nations entity and organization. Achieving effective behavioral science requires active engagement from all stakeholders, 
I would like to conclude by thanking our colleagues at IFAD for organizing today's event. We look forward to continuing our strong collaboration and build a strong and sustainable behavior change. Wish you a fruitful discussion and I thank you. Thank you so much, Marielena. I would like to highlight, highlight from your speech uh, the emphasis on cost effectiveness. And uh, indeed, it is uh, a low cost compared to the impact that behavioral sciences could deliver for, for our projects. Thank you also very much for emphasizing the partnership between the Rome-based agencies and the work that we are also doing through the Rome-based agencies uh, innovation team with uh, the focal points that uh, were established last year. So with that, uh, I would like to now move on to our interactive panel. And we'd like to introduce uh, Joe Puri, Director of the Environment, Climate, Gender, Youth and Social Inclusion Division at IFAT. Nancy Jennings Asurto, Deputy Director of the Food and Nutrition Division. Nate Peterson, Vice President for Partnerships at the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. And Daya Belchica, Lead Technical Specialist uh, of Gender and Social Inclusion. And Martin Prowse, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name uh, correctly, uh, Martin. Evaluation Specialist at the Independent Evaluation Unit of the Green Climate Fund. Joe will start by giving us a framework so that we can uh, have a much richer discussion in the panel. Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gladys. Uh, I'm assuming my time starts in a second. I do have slides to share, but I'm hoping very much that we can um, use this session to also make it far more interactive as we go along. Uh, but uh, let me also share a few slides with you. And as uh, Gladys alluded, so I have about six minutes and I'll try and keep to it. Uh, but I thought that uh, given the very rich remarks that uh, actually the op opening panelists uh, presented and the plenary speakers uh, brought out, especially with respect to partnerships, with respect to cost effectiveness, and uh, the salience really of behavioral science approaches in how they can help us deal with climate action as well as inaction and deal with nutrition and gender related challenges, I think it becomes very important now for us to also provide somewhat of a frame of a, for the overall discussion as we go forward. Um, so I'm Joe and going forward, I, I think really important, um, most, of, most of our listeners do know uh, that behavioral behavior is a big part of the challenge that we deal with in development. But I think it's important to know that behavioral science is slightly different from the vast literature around behavior. And the key difference is that behavioral science is using constructs for changing behavior that we want to make ourselves. So it's not driving us to undertake behaviors that we don't want to take, right? So this is what we want already. And behavioral science provides you know, changes in the architecture so that our ultimate payoffs for undertaking behavior change don't change. So for example, if you get thousand dollars to change your behavior, that's not a behavioral science intervention, right? It should be something that you want to do yourself, just can't do it because the architecture is not right. And so it's really important to then nail down as to what behavioral science represents. And this is the work of Richard Taylor and Cass Sandstein and others. Um, in decision making, I think what we are recognizing and what Cass Sandstein and Tversky's and, um, and uh, Richard Taylor's work is showing is that we have biases when we make decisions, right? And not all of it is based on um, um, knowledge or evidence that we have. And these biases can be overconfidence bias. Oh, I know what to do, loss aversion. I don't want to undertake a loss, but guess what? If you frame it as a positive thing or avoided losses, you're far more likely to take that action. Framing bias, how you frame a choice is really important. Whether it's framed as an avoided loss or a, or a, or a gain really changes as to, as to whether you undertake that action or not. Anchoring bias, um, what was your last experience? So that's your availability heuristic and how choices are presented. Essentially, in a summary, it's saying that decision-making is not just always on the basis of evidence, but really we are making decisions on the basis of other things as well. So human beings 
We all think and we all pride ourselves at thinking that we are very rational. We are like Mr. Spock here, but we are actually lazy in our minds. And there's a part of our brain that wants to make decisions very quickly. And we are actually like Bart Simpson on the left-hand side of your screen. Lazy, we want to make decisions on the basis of what we already know rather than processing new information, right? So many examples there of how behavioral science has been able to change our behavior. Um, in, my, in my previous duty station in Korea, I used to be given an electricity bill that also compared my electricity bill with my neighbors. If, and they were all therefore, by definition, controlled for by house size or apartment size, income, et cetera, because we were all living in the same neighborhood. But that's a pretty well-documented way of also reducing your energy consumption by comparing yours with others, right? Um, in other work that I've done with other co-authors of mine, we found that yes, insurance is, um, insurance that is provided to small scale uh, farmers um, is good, and we tend to be very supply driven in a lot of our thinking, but whether insurance when it is provided actually sees very little uptake. And this is primarily because we don't make it very easy for farmers to take on or buy weather insurance even though they actually would like to when we conduct willingness to pay studies, for example, right? So we found that basically uptake with respect to weather-based insurance systems was anything between 18 to 23% of the overall target group, which is so one-fifth of your target group was really taking it on. And forget, forget about the numbers in the second year. We can talk about those later. When we, my co-authors and I, um, undertook a study of climate projects, and this is um, with specific agencies in mind, we found that most agencies, international agencies, so I'm speaking you know, to all of us as friends, found that we actually don't uh, deal with a lot of this challenge in the last mile in most of our projects. So moving rapidly ahead, I think the important thing is that we've got to consider the importance of judgments, preferences, and choices when we are thinking about how to target behavior change through behavioral science. Um, there are key challenges that we found when we did our study on climate projects, and I realized that I might run out of time, so I just quickly want to talk about the intention action gap that was also mentioned earlier. The fact that we tend to bias our decisions on the basis of on, on the present rather than on the long term. The third, that we hate taking on loss, losses, but also that if you ask people to invest in loss prevention, when there are other immediate needs that are not being met, people don't want to invest in those, right? So climate change is your prime example. Uh, Self-efficacy and identity. So if there are changes to traditional methods, those tend to be least accepted. If you're to, within groups, so there's groupthink. If you are bringing people together, uh, reconciling different knowledge systems is really key. And last but not least, if there is an overload of information, it discourages action, right? So essentially, I think what I really want to come to is that there are many challenges that threaten environmental sustainability and that are rooted in human behavior. So what we want to take away is that when we are designing our investments, when we are thinking about what works on the ground, we've got to understand what motivates people, but also their biases and shape project interventions right from the beginning in their design, understanding while incorporating this understanding, and secondly, uh, intentionally examine preconceptions about culture and context. And in all of this, we've got to consider our biases because we are human. Thank you very much. And with that, <laughs> I'm back to the panel. And I'm really, really pleased to have a very, very strong panel with us today. Um, as Ladis said, we have um, four panelists, and I'm going to start um, the panel discussion with, by inviting Nate Peterson from Busara. Um, and Nate has been working with agritech companies a lot. So Nate, I have two questions for you, but let me start with the first one. Um, agritechs are helping farmers to mitigate risks by offering climate resilient inputs, advisory services, insurance, and other facilities. In your view, how can behavioral science help to improve 
not only uptake, so that is adoption, but really sustained use of these full suite solutions. Over to you for a couple of minutes, please. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, and thank you very much for, for having us uh, at Busara and and uh, the, the very uh, kind of elegant opening remarks that frame this discussion nicely. So I think uh, one of the nice things about Busara, one of the, the, my favorite parts about working uh, working where I do um, in East Africa and Nigeria, especially, is that we get to work with some of the most innovative agri-tech companies uh, in the world, I think, and and work on some of the most critical problems, you know, hoping to find these these sustainable solutions. So, you know, some of these are are funded by by UN agencies, by FCDO, um, by the by the Gates Foundation. Um, had the privilege of working with Acumen and and Pula, the the um, kind of insure tech, and and many other social impact. Uh, investors and even private equity groups are actually funding the uptake of climate resilient solutions, which is has been really encouraging and allowed us to collect an immense amount of data. So in the remarks I'm making, I'm, I'm kind of aggregating some of the, the broad insights, but I'll make specific references as, as I can. So I think one of, the, one of the biggest problems that we run into in you know, we, we come up with these amazing solutions. We know that drought resistant, you know, maize seed is something that could be widely taken up and is in fact offered by lots of, of agri-tech companies across the world. It, you know, insurance, as you mentioned earlier, weather index or, or crop cut insurance, different different versions of agriculture insurance are, are really effective and solve problems on paper, uh, on paper pretty effectively, but we don't know how to get, get farmers to sign up for them. Um, we don't know how to bundle them always exactly with the, with the right seeds or fertilizers or, you know, private or government loan programs. And so, you know, what we've realized in experimenting um, kind of ac across these products and services and thinking about how they, they should be offered, offered to the market is that trust is just, the, the, you know, probably the most formidable issue. And the reason is that often, like these aren't, we're not the first organization, our partners aren't the first organizations to try to sell things to smallholder farmers, whether it's whether it's information, whether it's new, you know new seed products, um, and so that can be that can be a really big challenge. And when when we think about these things, we come up with we come up with these great solutions, we bring them to the market, and of course we believe in them. And the the most critical error that we've seen is that we we tell people all of the great things and the sort of most unique optimistic cases of how outcomes can arise. Right, we we tell them the the, the very top end of the spectrum of what could happen. And that overpromising right off the bat creates a situation in which we're likely to fall short and, and you know, create gaps from with regard to their expectations such that we degrade trust even if their outcomes are qualitatively better with these products and services and they become more resilient over time. So you can actually end up creating a solution that still disappoints the farmer and therefore you know, can, lead to, can lead to issues of, of reuptake and, and these other things. Um, and thinking about information sources isn't always done very well, to be honest. Uh, we've, we've seen examples where you know, we, we tested how to communicate about agriculture insurance from, the perspective, from different perspectives, right? So is the agriculture insurance being promoted by, by you know, the, like the Bank of Industry in Nigeria? Is it being promoted by an NGO? Is it being promoted by a UN agency? Is it being promoted by the farmers agricultural cooperative? You know, maybe single value chain, maybe not. And, and one of the things that we've realized is that, you know, some of these much more local solutions can be effective. And so in Nigeria, for example, we recognize that cooperatives are just a really amazing um, mechanism uh, for, for communicating with farmers. However, on the inclusion, on the inclusion front, many cooperatives are run you know, almost entirely by men. And we'll see, an, we've, we've seen an example in which if, a, if an insurance product was promoted by an agricultural cooperative, men be, were much more likely to recommend it to a friend and pay for it. Women were less likely than if they had just heard about it in some other controlled way. And so, you know, we can already tell, tell right there that if we ho hope to close some of these inclusion gaps and, and, you know, make sustainable solutions for everyone that we need to start addressing these various aspects of trust and, and the nuances, especially across across groups. Um, in addition to, to tempering expectations and thinking about the sources of information, we need to help farmers understand that any solution comes with risks, right? You could invest in a really wonderful solar irrigation system that 
that uh, you know doesn't doesn't fully um, you know kind of live up to your expectations, uh, and it can in, in fact create uh, cost issues for you down the, down the road. And we we paint everything so beautifully and don't always remember to to you know think about how these products could play with um, with farmers' trust. Uh, and I think it's it's most important now. We focused a lot on agronomic advice and and providing agronomic advice in a, in addition to these products and services. Um, but many farmers now have heard agronomic advice from lots of different sources. Some of it very good, some of it not so good. And a key component to enacting that agronomic advice is actually having knowledge of of market systems and market access, and, and thinking about how these uh, these kind of businesses have have gaps. Thanks very much, Nate. So um, it's right on the mark. And I was going to ask you a question about social inclusion, but I'm not going to do that uh, yeah. because our time is up for this slot. But I, I did um, recognize and just to reiterate that the key focus from you was trust, building that trust, also communicating risk to farmers, um, and then also recognizing that there are gender differences in how peer pressure or peer mm -hmm peer group communication occurs and being very cognizant about it as we think about uptake, but also transmission of knowledge. So thanks very much for that. Um, I'm gonna move on uh, now to uh, Dr. Martin Press. Uh, Martin uh, from the Independent Evaluation Unit of the Green Climate Fund. And Martin, my question for you, and you have five minutes, please. Um, how is the IU of the Green Climate Fund uh, building the capacity of project managers uh, to integrate behavioral science into climate projects? Um, and what are your key insights from theory, but also practice? Thanks, and thank over to you. Thank you ever so much, Joe, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this excellent panel. And also like to thank um, Juan Lucas, Anita, and Maria Helena for the excellent opening remarks, which opened this discussion. Um, so how is the independent evaluation unit building the capacity of project managers um, to integrate behavioral science in climate projects? So I'll respond to this question um, by using the independent evaluation unit's behavior and design lab, and also the unit's LORTA program, both of which were created by Joe, Joe Puri, when Joe was head of the independent evaluation unit here in Songdo in South Korea. So part of our capacity building efforts focus on supporting project managers of GCF projects to consider behavioral science approaches. And how do we do this? Well, I'll explain our approach and then I'll explain some of the challenges that we face. Um, so in terms of the planning and development of projects, we encourage project managers to conduct early formative research to understand potential beneficiaries. Um, so to explore attitudes, perceptions, motivations, um, to try and get a, a rounded understanding of, of social norms and also to explore the best channel to communicate with beneficiaries, um, and also who should be the messenger, who, who, who the most effective messenger is. So such formative research can take place um, whilst the concept note is being developed, and also whilst the project proposal is being, is being fleshed out and mapped out. Um, in terms of implementation, um, we encourage project managers to consider how technical capacity building um, which is a feature of, of many GCF projects, um, can use behavioral insights. Um, so for example, to not, to not flood participants with information because that risks, um, that risks cognitive, cognitive overload. Um, and, and we can only absorb so much information at a, at a time. Um, secondly, to frame technical assistance in a way that it speaks to the, the lived experience, the daily lived experience of beneficiaries. Um, so that this will strike home and and increase um, um, in, in, increase increase the way that this technical assistance is is used. Um, and thirdly, to incentivize um, beneficiaries through appealing to their intrinsic motivations. Um, so we mainly implement this approach um, in our annual Lauter Design Workshop. So LAWTA stands for the Learning Orientated Real-Time Impact Assessment Program. Um, and this focuses on embedding causal impact evaluations, so experimental or quasi-experimental techniques within approved GCF projects. And our design workshop for this year will start at the end of August. Um, and within this workshop, we introduce project managers to behavioral science um, when we're working through the theory of change 
um, for the, the project or the subcomponent of the project, developing the evaluation questions and indicators for the impact evaluation. Um, and we, we encourage project managers to consider evaluating a subcomponent of the project that uses a behavioral intervention um, or addresses a behavioral mechanism. So one example here is a project on climate information systems, early warning systems and forecast-based financing. So here during practice drills for the early warning systems, um, project managers in one project are varying how messages are being delivered, um, how they're being framed to assess which form of messaging um, leads to most people using shelters and following the standard operating procedures for different forms of meteorological hazard. Um, so this is our approach um, and we've, we've had some success but we've also had challenges and I'll list some of the challenges. Um, so firstly we support project managers um, of approved projects. So some of the early formative research that we, 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 we promote isn't possible for that approved project, but instead project managers are starting to implement that formative research in the pipeline of concept notes and project ideas and project proposals that they're developing. Secondly, GCF projects can have over a dozen stakeholders. So in the example I've just given, um, we, held, we held over 12 hours of workshops with 12 agencies to ensure that there was buy-in and, buy and support for, um, for the evaluation of, the, um, of this particular um, messaging messaging delivery system. Um, so supporting project managers with behavioral science, it takes time, it takes trust, and it takes patience. And this brings us to the three foundations on which the LAWTA program is built. Firstly, country ownership. LAWTA responds to the urgent needs of, um, of, of climate action in developing countries. Secondly, flexibility. We need to evolve our designs, both in behavioral science and impact evaluation, um, as challenges occur, and this is obvious in the COVID context. And thirdly, uptake and use. So we broadcast the lessons that we're learning so we can integrate more behavioral science interventions in climate projects to address the climate emergency that many citizens in developing countries are facing. Um, back to you, Joe. Thanks, Martin. That was, uh, that was really good. And um, yeah, um, really good to see that you're taking forward very bravely and courageously and wisely a lot of that work and clearly in very new directions. And I really enjoyed your last three key points, especially on um, underscoring, I think the value of country ownership um, and therefore countries owning a lot of the insights and the knowledge that you're gaining as well, being flexible. And so being able to change course and third, um, really focusing also on uptake and all of those are course predicated on trust and exactly the things that Nate spoke about as well. Um, but also the fact that you are rooting a lot of this early formative work on looking at attitudes and channels and messengers and uh, rooting it in daily experiences. So thanks for that, Martin. I'm going to move to our next panelist and um, welcome Nancy uh, yet again uh, from FAO. And Nancy, um, can you tell us um, in a couple of minutes, um, I, I do have two questions for you, so just a heads up. Uh, can you tell us in a couple of minutes how behavioral science is reflected in FAO's work in nutrition? Thanks, and over to you. Thanks, Joe, for the question, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. I'm really thrilled to see behavioral sciences and, and insights being framed as innovation. You know, we often conflate innovation with technology, but I, I think there's so much more we can explore from behavioral sciences that can increase impact in, in food security and nutrition in, initiatives. Um, so some of you may already be aware that FAO members have recently approved a new vision and strategy for FAO's work in nutrition, which sets a framework for the organization's activities in nutrition for the next five years. And this FAO nutrition strategy states that FAO's mission in nutrition is to accelerate impactful policies and action across agri-food systems to enable healthy diets for all meaning FAO is committed to raising levels of nutrition and leveraging our experience and expertise to take a food systems approach to support nutrition. And what does this have to do with behavioral sciences? Well, going back to the final part of the mission statement, to enable healthy diets for all. We wanna enable healthy diets for everyone, recognizing there is no one size fits all solution. We have to consider, as, as Jo reflected in, in her comments, men and women, girls and boys, old and young, and the different ways that they interact with their environments. Um, and we also really have to focus on vulnerable groups, 
for our collective ambition that we have all committed to an Agenda 2030 of leaving no one behind. So to do this, our nutrition strategy has a number of guiding principles. And the very first one is that people must be placed at the center. And um, I was really excited to hear John Lu Lucas mention how important putting people at the center of action is. We need to understand people's lives and their needs as a starting point for identifying how policies and actions in agri-food systems can be impactful for healthy diets. Healthy diets need to be available and affordable and accessible and acceptable and appealing to people in the environment and the territories where they live in their reality. And data and evidence need to be gathered and analyzed within the context of people's lives. So this is really where that application of behavioral sciences is critical. The approach allows us some understandings, insights, and nuances that we're going to need to tailor our initiatives to address the human interaction with agri-food systems, the human interaction as producers, as workers, as food procurers or purchasers, and then, of course, as consumers. And so behavioral insights are absolutely critical to the efforts across food systems to ensure healthy diets for all. Fantastic, Nancy, really exciting and really great to hear that um, uh, Pau's strategy um, on nutrition incorporates behavioral science techniques um, and that they're considered integral uh, to especially outcomes and impacts related to nutrition. Can you give us some specific examples of how this is being put into practice? Thanks. Sure. Of course, of course, thanks. Um, so we found that behavioral approaches are really particularly important when we're talking about work and linkages among different areas. So like the nexus of climate, gender, and nutrition. Because people's behaviors, we don't neatly categorize our, our behaviors like we categorize the themes of our work, work streams, but rather those levers of motivation to fill that intention action gap that we've talked about um, can, can be relevant across these areas. So a, a couple of real concrete act, uh, examples. Um, I'll start with the example that, that um, Maria Elena touched on in her remarks, and that's the Demetra Clubs that are gender transformative approaches to um, support um, how communities can uh, develop together and act together using local resources to overcome um, challenges for their community development. And one example specific to nutrition is in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, in, in a province, the Shopo province, we found that, that there were all these dietary taboos that were limiting women's ability to get the healthy diets they needed. And in turn, we saw women had very high rates of nutritional deficiencies. And through these Demetra clubs, um, women have uh, worked with men in the communities, with community leaders, with community radio and authorities to um, break some of those taboos that were really just based on tradition, but not based on, on science or food quality needs in, in any way. And um, it's, it's a real specific example to show how this uh, gender reinforcing approach was supportive of nutrition. Um, beyond that, there are other examples. Um, we have some capacity development courses that we've developed. Um, that meet the needs for nutrition behavior change agents. Um, and following in-depth needs analysis, we, we developed a university level course to look at how future leaders of nutrition um, can affect nutrition education in, in their own communities. And FAO's school-based food and nutrition education approach really um, looks at that entire need for change that, that Anita brought up in terms of changing individual, group, institution, and community collectively. So these are just a couple of, of examples, Joe, but I hope it gives you a sense of some of the concrete action that FA has taken. Fantastic, really exciting. I really like the example of Demetra Clubs and, and the fact that you're focusing on local context, and Martin spoke about this in his remarks as well, and the fact that you've got to deal with, and I like the idea of also breaking local taboos, especially, and those get associated with women's nutritional uh, indicators to a very large extent. And we see that across uh, global geographies. So yeah, and of course the focus on long-term education. I think we've got to get ready for creating this cohort of leaders that are ready to incorporate a lot of this learning into um, as they become, um, as they come into decision-making roles. So thank you very much for that. And last but definitely not the least is my um, uh, esteemed colleague, uh, 
Nadia Belchika from uh, IFAD, who's the, who, from the Gender and Social Inclusion uh, Subdivision. And um, so here, Nadia, I, I'm going to ask you two questions as well. So two, two minutes per question, if that's OK. Uh, based The first one, based on your current understanding of behavioral science, how do you think that IFAD strengthens or intends to strengthen the nexus between um, gender equality, climate resilience, and nutrition? Over to you, Nadia. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. It's always uh, difficult to, to be the last one. Uh, so to, to actually add value to the conversation, but I'll do my best. So as, as many of you um, know, um, IFAD actually designed programs that address the root causes as well as structural barriers and power imbalances uh, for women and other marginalized groups, which perpetuates unhealthy or undesirable behaviors. So in its programs, um, in order to influence uh, behavior, IFAD generally addresses three broad domains of empowerment. The first one is capacities, which refer to individual and collective capacities, which also imply some knowledge and skills, and that is reflected in attitude, critical reflections, actions, and access to assets and services. The second domain is relations, uh, referring to relations within the household, within the community, and between organizations. And lastly, refers to structures that refers to informal as well as formal institutions, rules, policies, and laws. So that how do we put all of that together? So very succinctly, at the operational level, programming start with a number of assessment, including a diagnosis of social norms to really understand the different perspective and to what extent different groups have different priorities, different opportunities and different coping strategies. This then informs the theory of change. And then we put all of that together and adopt some um, transformative approaches. In the context of IFAD's work, among the different approaches, we use uh, what we call the household methodology to really promote deep behavioral changes. And in household methodology, we refer to two of them, the gender action learning system, GALS, or the household mentoring. And then for the purpose of this discussion, I will just focus on the GALS. So the GALS is very innovative. Um, it promotes gender equality and livelihood development. It is one, so IFAD is one of the leading institution that is using that it's in programming to really integrate the different uh, strand of work. Within its programs, IFAD has included the GALS in 50 projects. And then what is very key, as we have seen, is that the GALS is really focused on the people, it's people-centered, and then it's used a number of tools to actually participate and then involve the people in defining their strategy going forward. Over to you. Nadia, perfect, thank you. Um, appreciated the household methodologies and gals and the focus on capacities, relations and structures. And uh, so with that, can you give us some specific examples of how IFAD's programs use behavioral science, whether intentionally or not, to deliver results for uh, this integration of climate, gender, nutrition focus programs. And, in, and that should explain to you as to why you're the last, but definitely not the least because you're bringing together all of these different sectors, right, in your remarks. So thanks very much. You know. Sure. Um, sure, thank you. So what I would like to do is to share the example of Forma Pro. Um, it's a program in Madagascar that is a vocational training and agricultural productivity program using and piloting what we call the GALS Plus. So why is this GAL Plus? So GAL Plus is actually the GALS itself, which integrates gender equality considerations with climate adaptation and nutrition security consideration with a new tool that we call a climate and nutrition action tree. So that particular tool helps all the household members to actually identify the key challenges to climate change and nutrition security, the desired end state, and then the required actions. After 12 months of implementation, there was an outcome assessment that was conducted that actually measured and documented some very important results. And I will just mention a few. For the context of climate, uh, it was noted that as a result of the adoption of some of the practices, the use of practice of reforestation, the use of organic fertilizer, 
the practice of crop rotation increased respectively by 13, 9, and 12 percent compared to the control group. This only after 12 months of implementation. Related to um, economic empowerment, the business turnover increased by 44 percent only after 12 months. And now if we look at quickly, uh, because I know that time is of essence, so I would just like to quickly take a look at the result for uh, nutrition. We see that the production of vegetable increased by 73%. The budget allocation for uh, nutritious food, as well as a participation to cooking class was increased by 39%. And then the percentage of households that actually were consuming more than five food groups increased by 21%. So what was key was really to include those different tools at the same time to rely on the facilitator that is local to actually build on that trust and then to rely also on the knowledge and then the intra-household relationship within the different members to align the different priorities. Over to you. Thanks, Mariah. That's uh very well summed up and it also relates and it's sort of we've come a full circle because it started off with Nate talking about the importance of trust and a key part of trust is also generating some of this evidence right and and then recognizing these gender differences that you brought out very saliently uh, and I really like the fact that you could relate um, a lot of the consequences especially with respect to nutritional diversity that you recognized at the household levels so an increase of 21 percent over your control group um, through pretty rigorous work, right? Um, and you could attribute it to a lot of the interventions on the ground. Um, and so with that, I think my very easy task as a moderator um, for this rapid fire round comes to an end. Uh, and I'm really privileged to hand it back. Well, definitely very honored to have had these very four wonderful speakers as part of this panel and uh, to, to hand it back to Gladys. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Joe, and uh, thank you to all the speakers for uh, sharing with us uh, evidence, but um, also data. Data is key to, for us to, to make decisions, so thank you so much for, for sharing that data. So I would like to ask uh, all of our speakers to turn their video on. So uh, I think that we're missing Anita and Marielena um, and Juan Lucas. If you could please turn your video on. We have a question that has been upvoted, and I believe it is addressed to Anita. Uh, Segun Fayomi is asking, it is interesting when you discuss gender equality from the lens of uh, women involvement at the level of innovation design using behavioral science. How can we ensure women are more involved in the benefits of such end results that we have observed uh, further, further elevated and their male counterparts? Well, I would call that a million dollar question because there is no easy answer to how do you get more women involved? Um, look, I think this is both at the community level, but it's also about signals that all of us who are involved in these issues send in terms of how we apply a gender lens to project design, to project interventions, um, to decision-making, who's at the table when we are designing these interventions and how explicitly we are making sure that gender concerns are part of project design. I mean, that's the behavioral change that we all need to make as those who are designing interventions and not just think about women as at the receiving end of these interventions. So I actually think that since we are talking about behavioral change, we should be taking a very hard look at our own behaviors when it comes to design and interventions and really asking tough questions about whether or not these are gender inclusive in every possible way so that we are bringing the benefit of that thinking into um, uh, design intervention at an early stage. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anita. Moving on to the, to the next question. Uh, we have a question about one challenge with donor funding is that it should be successful with fixed indicators, time and resources. However, results of development work come with uncertainty. It is equally important uh, to understand the process and critically reflect it. How can we all overcome the bias by donors? Who would like to address this question? I can go, but I'm quite sure many others can as well. I, I, 
Gladys, is that okay? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, um, I think I think actually quite a few of the panelists and um, Anita and Marielena um, also referred to some of this, I, I think, in their remarks. But a large part of this is uh, creating a cohort, I, I think, of, of donors and leaders in this space. But also, uh, we behavioral science teaches us that we tend to shun things that we don't understand. So if we if we are if we don't understand something, we are not going to be uh, at the receiving end of any evidence or wisdom that's coming our way, which says that look, you should be a little bit more flexible, and you should be thinking about adaptive approaches in project design or uh, or how we develop and design and implement our overall investments. So I think a key and in necessary but definitely not sufficient ingredient of seeing this change in the landscape has to be also educating contributors who come to this space to recognize that there is um, there is an important opportunity for us to um, also uh, build that capacity amongst leaders, amongst donors, amongst contributors, so that they become less impervious to a lot of this evidence coming through. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Any other contributions? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next question. Okay. I was just want to. Uh, sorry, uh, Gladys. I wanted to echo one of one of Joe's points, which is that um, having having um, projects. So you know, I scope projects for for Busara uh, most of my days, um, and having having projects that have have indicators and and kind of time points where we can sufficiently kind of understand and and think about pivots in in the actual program and even management and measurement structure. Uh, has turned out to be really, really critical um, and, you know, results in projects that are much more kind of dynamic and adaptive to the markets where they're working and the population. So um, I, I, <laughs> it, this is almost a plea for, for people who are funders to think about how they can, you know, put those benchmarks and, and roadmaps into the, the project scopes so that they can be sufficiently adaptive. But Thank you, Nate. Joe? Sorry. Yeah, Gladys, I was just going to say, I think another insight from behavioral science is peer influence, right? Um, and so getting a couple of donors who can be champions and then getting them to be sort of the front face for all other donors, I think will help because we use that in all, a lot of our program design and project design. Yeah, have champions, have influencers, you know, social media is filled with these instances. So why not have influencers amongst donors as well? There are actually quite a few out there. Who are at um, you know who are being frontiers people and uh, and are going out there and understand this space so they should be I, our champions. I tried to open my remarks with some of them, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Um, the next question is: In most of the behavioral studies, the control study focuses on incentivized scenario for quick analysis. What would be the best way to conduct behavior study uh, within a short span of time? Yeah, I'd be happy to, to take this question because I, I take it almost every day, as a matter of fact. Um, so this is a really great question. When people think of, of getting people to do things, we think of kind of incentives and punishments, carrots and sticks. You know, we like to call them for simplicity's sake in behavioral science. Um, and, and one of the most effective ways, especially with, with a new funder or partner organization, of helping them understand that that kind of these really basic sticks and carrots aren't the only way to do things is to is to have these other types of you know choice architecture and reframing of, of kind of questions and the way that we are even talking about you know maybe a new technology with a farmer um, it kind of kind of you know we horse race them for, for lack of a better term right you can you can do RCTs that aren't you know they don't have as as grand uh, a grand conclusion as something Esther Duplo might do, but you can you can do these things on much shorter timelines with with much more immediate indicators and actually bring behavioral science alongside the traditional characteristic and training type methods um, and, and actually prove that some of these behavioral science led approaches are, are in, a, in, a, in fact more effective in a measured um, clear way so that you know the, the funders will continue uh, on the projects. Thank you, Nate. Uh, we have a question for Marielena. Um, it's on action on climate and other challenges requires changes in values of all involved, changes in uh, what we care about. What does behavioral science have to say about how values change? Marielena, are you with us? I saw her, she was just uh, a second ago, she was here with us. Uh, Nancy, do you, do you want to take this question on behalf of Marielena or should we give the floor to Martin? 
Um, I don't mind saying a few words and then and then perhaps I'll leave space for for Martin as well. So, um, you know, the, the idea about having to to change values is is indeed something that that we recognize because we we see that um, this is exactly one of one of the reasons that just providing information doesn't lead actual to, to to change because just provision of information is not enough to 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 make uh, fundamental changes in in the ways that we view the world and the world around us, and so we we recognize that um, be behavioral science gives us more tools to look at what are the reasons that values are what they are. And in my example of the changing of the the taboos, uh, cultural taboos around diet, is is exactly that. There was a value system that led to women not consuming certain foods that were actually very important for them for good nutrition, and so it it took. Um, it, it took internalizing um, the motivation and uh, information, of course, is part of the story, but it's also understanding why we behave the way that, that we do and then um, being able to nuance how we approach what needs to be, be changed. And maybe I'll leave it at that and, and allow Martin some space to provide some of his insights. Thank you, Nancy. And just to follow up quickly, just on, on values, I mean, within climate projects, you can you can frame a particular intervention around sort of civic pride, for example, or around around particular particular social norms, such that the the climate project can be um, can be can be taken up and by by many more people, and as in, ensuring that these that the climate project intersects um, with with um, with local values, and um, this this can this can certainly improve um, the outcomes from from these types of investments. Um, so thank you, Nancy, and and back to you, back to you, Gladys. Thank you, Martin. Uh, actually, we do have a question that is uh, uh, directly addressed uh, to you from Andrea Sanchez. She's saying, based on your experience, have you been able to integrate behavioral insights in diagnostics of the programs and projects you mentioned? There is not much literature of behavioral diagnostics able to integrate the three important drivers for sustainability of today's webinar, gender equality, resilience, and nutrition. Uh, would you like to answer that question, Martin? Sure, I'll give it a go. Um, behavioral diagnostics. This sounds complicated, but I don't think it is. Um, and within the Independence Evaluation Unit, we've been receiving a lot of support from Nate and Busara in terms of in terms of behavioral diagnostics. So, for example, in terms of the early formative research that we were promoting as our, promoting to project managers, it's important to integrate behavioral science into projects. So, Nate and his team have really highlighted the importance of focusing on, on sort of time preferences, for example, social preferences, risk preferences within this early formative research. So that's what I understand by sort of behavioral diagnostics. And, and so sort of through this um, um, through this collaboration we've had with Busara and the, um, the, the interactions we've had with project managers, um, this is, these are exactly the means through which we're, we're trying to integrate more behavioral science insights into, into the GCF project portfolio. Um, back to you, back to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Martin. We uh, we do have a quite interesting question uh, in the in the Q and A. How can we de a decision maker in the decision making process? Who would like to take that question? I, I will. Though that's a very hard question. Oh, does, was someone else there as well? No, you go first, Nate. Okay, um, th so this is this is an excellent question and one that that you know decision theorists and behavioral economists have been working on since um, you know most significantly the the early '80s. But it's it's a hard one, right? Um, oftentimes we think about well, if you want to debias someone, you have to give them information. And as I think Nancy has stated beautifully twice, and made a big smile on my face. Information provision is never enough to debias people ever. If you think that you're going to hold an information session and people will come even if there aren't snacks. You don't, we, of course you should have snacks at an information session, but if, if you think that no one would come, then no one is there to learn, right? So you, you have to create information in a circumstance in which people actually want to absorb it because they understand that that information is not the end itself, but the means to the end of, of improving their income, of improving their children's nutrition, you know, whatever the outcomes might be. And so I think, um, you know, how specifically you do this has a, has a widely varying answer. But the, the start of that process is always to really understand the context. Oftentimes we think people aren't doing things because they don't understand them. And that is wrong more often than not, which I cannot stress enough. And that's like a, a way that I lead um, a, a lot of 
kind of courses, for example, with IEU in, in behavioral science is that oftentimes people just haven't prioritized the thing that you want them to do. And it's because you're misunderstanding their values and their motivations. And so that's where you have to start if you want to know the correct way to debias them. It might not be information. It might be a debiasing of, or a changing of values or motivations. Joe? That is, yeah. Uh, so can I just say that um, a few years ago, the World Bank and the Fed did this very brave study, I have to say for them, because they looked at their own staff who were in decision-making roles to then understand as to how they were dealing with evidence that was coming to them. And um, of course, the epilogue of the story is that they found that these were, you know, highly educated staff members who all had MAs and PhDs in different subjects. But when evidence was given to them, but depending on whether how it was framed and how uh, how much they had already invested in the projects and the investments that they were making, these decision makers were more than likely to make a mistake and to act on their biases rather than on the information that was coming to them. And this is DFID and World Bank staff members, right? So more than likely to act only on their biases rather than on the evidence that is coming to them. And so they worked on continuing to invest in, study, in projects that they had already put in time and money into. They continued to uh, go along with their biases, go along with their confirmation bias, et cetera. So I think, and the key idea there was deliberative discussions, right? When people are making decisions and when you know they're going to have biases, get them into a room and get them to talk about it because they're more likely to confront their biases then. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Nadaya, if you would like to contribute something really, really quickly because we're out of time. Thank you. Yes, uh, what I wanted to contribute, I wanted to echo what Nate uh, has just mentioned that um, you know, poor farmers or poor women in the rural communities, they are rational individuals. So we may not understand the motivation, but they know why they're making a decision. So that is why it's extremely important to spend the time to actually do a proper situational assessment and also to communicate that information to some of the decision makers, because typically they would not necessarily consider the choices and the priorities of the rural poor because they do not have a voice. And so then for us who are in this community, I mean, it is our job to actually give them a voice to represent the interest with really understanding what is the motivation and to put that in the language that the decision maker would understand with some kind of trade off analysis and so forth. So I think it's very important that we keep that in mind over. Thank you, Nadaya. Actually, that goes into one of the questions that we have in the, in the Q&A box, uh, not only making sure that we give uh, the, our beneficiaries a voice, but uh, the importance of communication and storytelling, not only for behavioral sciences, but for innovation in general. Storytelling is a, is a key component of uh, making sure that you're advancing innovation. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, tell uh, our audience that even though we didn't get to all of the questions, we will do our best to answer them and share the answers with you through a link that we will be sharing with everybody that registered for today's event. Uh, and uh, we will, the link will take you to our event proceedings page. With that, I would like to now welcome uh, IFAD's Vice President, Dominic Ziller. And uh, Dominic, because we're short of time, I'll, I'll just, I'll just uh, give the floor to you right away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gladys. And um, um, it, is, it is not by accident that um, the innovation team of IFAD has organized this event because we're really talking about a core element of, of innovation. And um, Gladys, uh, just one thing that, that I really need to say, um, I don't know whether you have a twin sister or whether you never sleep because we have so many innovation events over the last few weeks and you were always at the center organizing them, moderating them. So I, I really need to say many, many thanks uh, for, for this incredible work and also for organizing today's event. Many thanks also go to, to the moderators, to the panelists, uh, to everybody who has contributed. I think this is really a, a cornerstone of what we need to do in the future, as we all know that um, the financial means that will be at our disposition to achieve um, the SDGs, and in particular, the core SDGs one and two, elimination of hunger, elimination of poverty, the ODA means will be limited. So we will need to be more innovative, we will need to be more creative to enhance effectiveness, to enhance efficiency in order 
to make more SDG achievement out of these limited means. And um, I think it's also the right point in time for behavioral science coming into development cooperation and coming into the SDGs. Because in former times, maybe people could still say, yeah, there might be climate change, but uh, say it in French, après moi le déluge. Yeah, once, once it will occur, I will already be dead, so I won't suffer from it. And if you are egoistic enough, you will just continue your consumption patterns and put the burden if you have children on your children. Today, this is not possible any longer. I mean, we are all younger than we look, but um, um, even at the age of 50, 55, 60, you know that you will still live, if you live the average age, you will live to see the consequences because we already start to see the consequences of what happens with uh, all the developments in climate, um, in biodiversity, pollution of the oceans, and so on and so forth. So yes, it is true, there is a gap between our intentions and our actions. And we need to be informed of that. We need to be aware of that to change our behavior patterns. I like the question on how can we influence decision makers? Because there is another après moi le déluge. After the next election, the le déluge, yeah, when I have exhausted the number of mandates I can go through. And I think it's not in the first place behavioral scientists that can influence um, political decision makers, but it's the electorate. Because as long as we face a situation where, well, people will vote for the guy who says, well, it's all overrated. Climate change is not as dramatic as predicted. Those are the scientists. Uh, trust me, you don't need to change your behavior patterns. Um, as long as these people are winning the elections, um, we are in deep shit. We are in problems. So what we need to do is to influence the broader public in order to elect the people that take the decisions that need to be taken. Um, I like very much what Joe said about uh, moving towards um, greater resilience in climate change. And, and frankly, that is climate change is indeed uh, the one topic where this gap between human intentions and our activities is probably the largest one. And we also heard that the behavioral barriers occur not just within investments, but also how we ourselves as staff of international organizations examine and interpret evidence and translate it into action. Yes, there's also room for improvement. We also have our thinking patterns, our behavior patterns, and we need to overcome these. And in particular, IFAD, as an agency that is very committed to uh, evidence-based strategies and policies is really dedicated um, to reducing these inherent human biases that are commonplace to, to, to most of us. Um, it was very interesting to listen today to how our agencies are translating learning into action and into results for our beneficiaries. And um, I think that diagnostic studies that were mentioned several times could indeed play a key role in this, in this process. In the end, if we look at the SDGs, there are a few elements that should be crucial. First of all, encouraging more sustainable consumption, more, more sustainable consumption patterns. Then obviously to promote practices that protect the environment, that protect biodiversity. We need to transform social norms so that we can end domestic violence, that we can support equality and inclusion. We also need to improve health. And COVID has, has taught us that by using trusted messengers to promote vaccination and better nutrition. In, in my home country, Germany, we now have uh, prominent people on poster campaigns. I have taken my vaccine, do the same. And, and on the, at, at, at the other end of the spectrum, we have scientists explaining why it is necessary. This combination seems to be quite promising because people are now more open to vaccination than they were before. Well, and finally, um, it's a no-brainer. We need to encourage our agencies, and today is the best uh, example, to work together and jointly deliver better results uh, for our beneficiaries within the UN system. That should go without saying anyway, because we all are uh, committed to the uh, development system reform. But um, events like this one today, um, are, are really crucial to achieve this. So therefore, once again, um, many thanks to all of you who have um, uh, sacrificed your valuable time to participate and uh, to be part of this. Have a nice rest of the day. Many thanks. Back to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Dominique. And, uh, and thank you also for, uh, for those closing remarks and emphasizing you know, how our choices today can make a, a real difference for, uh, for the future. 
So uh, I would like now to, uh, before we close today's event, invite you to our next IFAT Innovation Talk. We will be talking about the role of the public sector in the assimilation process of innovative agrotechnologies. Uh, this, is, this event will be done in partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Israel. And so that will take place again on the 14th of July. I would like to thank all of our speakers uh, and the partners uh, agencies that uh, were with us today and give a special thanks to our team behind the scenes, Edward Gallagher, John Lerth, Michelle Tang and Carmela Lopez, and to our colleagues in the Environment, Climate, Gender, Social Inclusion and Youth Division and uh, in the Partnerships uh, Division of uh, FAO. Again, thank you so much and uh, see you on the 14th of July. Goodbye.